हेलो एंड वेलकम टू वॉक द टॉक और लेट मी मेक इट बेटर लेट मी से हेलो एंड वेलकम बैक टू वॉक द टॉक बिकॉज वी आर नाउ बैक विद ए न्यू सीरीज ऑफ वॉक द टॉक इंटरव्यूज आफ्टर ए शॉर्ट ब्रेक एंड हु डू वी हैव एज आर गेस्ट टू रिज्यूम दिस सीरीज माइंड एज ब्रिलियंट एंड वंडरफुल एज रिचर्ड हास करेंटली प्रेजिडेंट काउंसिल ऑन फॉरन रिलेशन But as we say in India, uh, I think in English should say veteran, which doesn't translate very well in Hindi. In Hindi, in, in Hindi, we'll say purana papi, an old sinner in the business of po- policy, uh, strategic affairs, etc., etc., etc. If you if you get old enough and you hang around long enough, people start saying nice things about you. But people can say nasty things if, if because your stuff is all in writing. Uh, so if you <laughs> <laughs> that's true. If it turn out wrong. uh people will say nasty things about you there's but they line, can't say that about you well thank you there's a line in american politics that if you're running for office what you pray for is that your opponent wrote a book <laughs> <laughs> yes because <laughs> the opponent goes out of gives uh, you uh, gives you ammunition absolutely so uh the two landmark works you've done uh one is 1997 the reluctant sheriff america and i do remember that your view was that america should be much more involved and much more of an active sheriff internationally uh, and the second the more recent one uh, obviously you foresaw the rise of trump etc a world in disarray so let me ask you i mean you have proven right on both uh, which is the reason we resumed this series with you uh, <laughs> i wish i were wrong on both <laughs> you wish you were wrong but where have you been uh, i mean have you been as right as it seems or you be you underestimated the change Well, the earlier book, uh, I was worried about the United States after the Cold War yes. essentially relaxing too much, and, right. and I think it was true at the time of Mr. Clinton. I think it later turned true. And then 9/11 happened, and that changed. It changed. And if anything, we overreached. overreached. And I think history will judge George W. Bush and the Iraq War as overreaching. Second, George W. Bush number two. Number two. Not the first. Not the first. No, actually, there was a big difference between the two, and I think the first. in some ways by doing what he did with Kuwait and Iraq but also putting limits on it was uh to me history will judge him very well very well because he let Saddam be there he, yeah he didn't we did not march on Baghdad because we right. knew we had a pretty good idea of the trouble we'd get into which is in fact pretty much what happened with the 2003 Iraq war exactly. we got too ambitious what happened more recently the world in disarray i i was looking at the world and what i essentially saw were certain trends the the spread of all this capacity military economic in many hands the aging and the deterioration of global institutions and so forth and i i predicted that the world would become increasingly messy or disorderly but you're right i i underestimated it and the one thing i never i didn't have the imagination to see again i, I wish it in this case well whether i was right or not doesn't matter what i missed was the united states changing so so dramatically the word i used uh a year later when i wrote the afterward to the second edition of the book i used the word abdication in history usually great powers imperial powers continue unless one of two things happen either they exhaust themselves that's what happened to great britain or essentially they get defeated which is really what happened to the soviet union This is, the, this is the first time in history a great power has simply said we don't want to be a great power quite the same way anymore hmm. and is that a personal decision from trump or is that the public opinion now that's a big question because the What's ant- he riding is he uh, is america riding his view or is he riding america's view uh, the answer is a little bit of both <laughs> right. but it's an important question because it raises the issue of after trump what do we have is he an aberration is he an exception or is he a signal of the future and my answer is it's probably a bit of both i think after the iraq war after afghanistan the expression is intervention fatigue real con- real a certain tiredness with american on uh, military intervention around the uh, world also a lot of economic insecurity what i think you're seeing in the united states is the result of what a decade and a half or two decades of wage stagnation mm. and a lot of people getting economically concerned and secure they don't see their living standards improving so what have they done they've turned on trade they've turned on immigration and they've become more populist so that mr trump uh, he's deft he he's a canny politician and he's picked up on deft, that d e f t d e f t not, not daft <laughs> 
No, daft. D E F T. Yes. He picked up on it. He has good. Uh, because a lot of his rival thing is daft. But I'll, he's not. I'll let others say what they will. Uh, but he, he sensed that. He picked up on it. But he's also, though, reinforced it. So Trump is at one and the same time. He's both a reflection of the American mood, the American psyche, but he's also something of an intensifier. Mm. He, he's both, so he's both a follower and a leader. So uh, one of your uh, most telling statements on leadership, you said there can be three kinds of leadership. One is drift. I think you referred to Clinton a little bit at that point. And you said America has had it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. The second is business as usual. Either, you said, leads to a crisis. Uh, it can even be a crisis like world should get tired of lending its money to America to buy American bonds. And third, you said, a populist. If I may say so, not your word, mine, a nutty populist. First of all, all three scenarios have come true. And second, what do we have now? We clearly have a, a populist. It's not just in the United States. I mean, look, you have, it's all over the world. Yes, I mean, I, I look at the map of the world. I see, I, I see Trump, I see Putin, I see Abe, Xi Jinping, Modi, Net, uh, Erdogan, Netanyahu, and when you get bored, Duterte. Yeah, the, the, so, the phrase I sometimes see used as a democratic recession, hmm. that we're, we're seeing that. Uh, in the, one of the most common you know, words in our business or phrases is liberal world order. Right. And what we're seeing is two things. It's much less liberal hmm. and it's much less orderly. And this has suddenly become a, a much more worrisome moment in so, history. So a world run by these alpha males. Uh, <laughs> uh, for all their power is less orderly than before. Oh, much less orderly. Because normally you would think once you have a strong leader, there'll be order. No, and uh, what we're seeing <coughs> is domestically, yes, more top heavy. But we're seeing actually less international cooperation. And the problem is we're seeing it less at a time we need more of it. Mm. One of the arguments I've been making in my books is that in this era of globalization, no single country can manage the challenges by itself. We actually need greater degrees of cooperation on climate, on proliferation, on, on terrorism, on trade, what have you, on virtually, on, on say, coming up with the rules for cyberspace. In every one of these areas, we need greater international collaboration. And what we're seeing, we're actually beginning to see less. It's one of the reasons, again, I keep coming back to the word disarray. And it's one of the reasons uh, I'm worried. We've also seen one other thing. We're seeing the reemergence of great power rivalry. We thought yes. it had basically been put aside. And here we are. We're now seeing a major revival. Uh, now, now we have Putin revealing his new missile. We have Trump talking of <laughs> a bigger button. I thought we had put it all behind us. No, we as the entire world. Well, remember you know, one of the big popular works, first an article, then a book, was the end of history. Right. And the idea was domestically, Fukuyama. Fukuyama. Yeah. The argument was domestically, you'd have these liberal combination, capitalist, you know, socialist, but democratic countries, and the global, the democratic peace theory. All these countries would be largely democratic, and then the world would be more peaceful, more, people would act more responsibly, both towards their citizens and towards their neighbors. And what we're seeing is just the opposite where people now acting more repressive at home, and we see them acting in a more bellicose way or a less cooperative way beyond their borders. Well, uh, Francis Fukuyama was on Walk the Talk, and he said that, yes, maybe a new era in world history is beginning, but he was very focused on China. In fact, he now says that China is a bigger threat to the world than terrorism. Well, China is a great power, and the real question, as is always the case with great powers, is how does it decide to use its power? Right. Now, one thing people have clearly been disappointed about with China is they were hoping uh, that integration, that China being involved in the world economically in other ways would lead to greater liberalism at home. And what the, the opposite well, has happened. Just the opposite has happened. We see that with the end of term limits on the presidency, the anti-corruption program. China's becoming more illiberal. How should America be look at this? Because America has a stake in how China changes. I don't think there's a whole lot we can do about how China organizes itself. What we should focus on, though, is how China uses its power abroad. And we should say, <coughs> if, you, if you're going to, for example, do certain things unilaterally in the South China Sea, you can't get away with that. We need to continue to sail through it and fly over it. We should say, we welcome you as a trading nation, but, and only if, you trade by the rules. And we should be much clearer and much more willing to enforce the rules, but uh, we should work with them where we can, say, but, on, on but, North Korea. But does this America have that leverage with China? Well, the problem is we've given up some of the leverage. Yes. Uh, one area in particular is over our debt. 
China along with Japan is one of the two largest. Trillions of dollars of your bonds. Yeah, so we, we, we leave ourselves vulnerable. It's, it's interesting, people don't sometimes connect the dots of national security. We think of national security as something that armies do. Yes, armies do it, but also central bankers are part, well, of, uh, uh, part of it. Yeah, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh used to tell us that the Chinese have this power, but don't overestimate it, because if the Chinese start selling American bonds and the yuan strengthens, the Chinese economy collapses. So there is a balance of Oh, it's terror. almost like, it's, exactly. Yes. It, in some ways, we're each vulnerable to the other. Right. There's, a, there's a nuclear balance of terror, and, and there's, there's an economic balance, because China also needs to export exactly. to the United States. Yeah, and China has been keeping its yuan low and low. Well, actually, in the last few years, they've behaved it's fairly responsibly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so this America, um, you're talking about an America now, uh, Richard, where the president fired Secretary of State on Twitter. Did anybody anticipate that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have, since this president does a lot of things on Twitter. But, you know, when I studied international relations 50, 40 years, 50 years ago at Oxford, Twitter had not been invented. The internet had not been invented. <laughs> so this wasn't in, this wasn't in my textbooks. Uh, what, what can I tell you? But what are the consequences of this, this kind of instability in your top team? Well, what the president said uh, just recently, he's now getting close to having the cabinet and the staff that he wants. And what I responded saying, but do you have this, the cabinet, what, needs. what you need? And that's the issue. And you don't just want to have people who agree with you. You want to have people of different experience, different judgment, different backgrounds and temperament. And uh, the criteria should not be that you're like-minded. Because then there, you're, you're, getting, you're denying yourself one of the essential checks and balances of, of government. You never want to make a policy and be surprised by the result cause, because you didn't, you didn't consider something adequately. And that's the danger in having too many people who are like-minded. You don't feel sorry for Tillerson? Well, I actually think history will be pretty rough on Mr. Tillerson. I, mean, I don't like the way he was fired. It, it lacked dignity and it, it doesn't speak well of Mr. Trump to fire somebody that way. You, you never get bigger by making somebody else look smaller. smaller. So he has humiliated him? Yeah, I mean, yes, but on the other hand, Mr. Tillerson did things as Secretary of State that people will be rightfully critical of. The way he allowed you know, the State Department to be diminished, his refusal to work with the experienced staff, uh, his going along with the reduction in, in resources, uh, this whole idea, why, 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 <laughs> this focus on reorganizing at the State Department at the time we have so many real crises to deal with in the world, from North Korea to Iran to Venezuela. I just, he, he came in as a CEO and he thought what worked for him in the world of ExxonMobil could be transferred to the world of diplomacy and it was a fundamental mistake and he never had a base. You can't succeed in Washington without a base. His natural base was the State Department and instead of working with it, he worked against it. So how does Mr. Modi deal with Trump's America? Well, look, I think you, know, you begin from a good position. One of the rare areas of bipartisanship in the United States in our foreign policy is India. Think about it. For the last 25 yes. years or so, Republicans and Democrats, it's been consistent and it's been a, a positive glide, right. a positive angle. the only thing on which both sides have fully agreed. Quite extraordinary though. Yes. It's actually, it's an exception, which is a welcome exception. And I think the, the growing concerns about China will feed into that. I think the, grow, the real potential for the economic relationship feeds into that because this is a truly underdeveloped still. Mm. It's a modest economic relationship. It ought to be much, much bigger. So I think no matter who's there, whether it's Mo, Mo, Mr. Modi or someone else on your, the Indian side, whether it's Mr. Trump or someone, on, on, someone else on our side, I think there's a logic a strategic logic and an economic logic plus the democracy aspect to U.S.-Indian relations. I think in some ways they're doomed to succeed. Doomed to succeed. But does India worry about Mr. Trump's temperament? What is to stop him from tweeting one day, hey, gee, you guys, why, what, what is this Kashmir, Kashmir that goes on? Why don't you just settle down, settle, well, meet tomorrow and settle it? You can be my guests. Look, I can't stand here honestly and say he won't do that. Uh, Part of Mr. Trump's, he, what he, part of his persona, part of his style, is he likes to surprise. He likes to keep things churning. Yes, Twitter should start charging him. <laughs> we'll, solve, we'll solve their. No, it's been very good for their stock. We'll so solve, their, solve their balance sheet problems. <laughs> but uh, but no, his style is churn. <laughs> yeah. His style and and but that's I. What I constantly argue is that is often a liability for a great power. We need to be predictable. 
Our friends need to know where we are and where we're going to be tomorrow. Our foes need to know where we are and where we're going to be tomorrow. So I don't think the, the politics of surprise, the, the policy of surprise, it may be tactically good on some occasions, it's almost never strategically good. So, so you need calm and stability and predictability. Predictability, reliability, continuity, which doesn't mean you don't change, yeah. but the change really ought to be considered. And also, to take a step back, the last 70 years, have been extraordinarily good for the United States, economically and strategically. So the bias, the default option, I would argue, should not be changed. Right. It's not as though we've got a terrible situation, we've got to exactly. turn upside down. Well, but he had to say that to win this election. I also think he believes it, based on my own conversations with him. I see. He believes that the trade relationships we've had for the last 70 years have hurt us. He attributes job loss to trade, not to innovation and productivity increases. And he looks at most of our alliances and most of what we do in the world, and he says, you know what? Parasites. Yeah, they are, they're free riding. We're doing all this. We're spending too much. We should save all this money. So he, he sees the costs of American leadership as much, much higher than uh, the benefits. I think that's wrong. But uh, needless to say, I, was, uh, I failed at persuading him. Richard, we've come this far without mentioning our favorite neighbor. Pakistan. Yeah. So uh, let's not talk about India-Pakistan relations, okay. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's too narrow focus. Okay. How does the world solve the Pakistan problem? Because yeah. Pakistan didn't get invaded. Iraq did. Uh, Palestinians lost their land. Uh, Libya, Syria, Afghanistan. All of them, them can complain, but the angriest Muslims in the world are in Pakistan, and they have this very strong army and nuclear weapons, and they have this real estate which has more AKs per square meter than any part of the world ever. You used a word of someone that I, I never use, particularly when it comes to Pakistan. You asked me how can we solve, and the answer is we can't. Okay. There's no solution for Pakistan. It, it, it was, <coughs> is, and will be one of the biggest problems in, in the world's inbox, and whether it's what it's doing in Afghanistan. Forever? Well, for the foreseeable future, yes. Mm -hmm. I, don't see, I don't see how Pakistan becomes a normal country. I don't see how Pakistan suddenly has a normal, responsible government with authority. It's got this veneer of civilian rule, but it's just mm -hmm. that. It's a veneer. It's controlled by the military. It's controlled by the intelligence services. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's providing still a sanctuary for the Taliban. It's got the world's fastest growing nuclear. Uh, arsenal has got all these terrorists, so it's yeah. It's also got the world's fastest growing large population. It's also, the, and the demographic challenge yeah. will be a real threat to its stability given its economic and resource issues. So how do you address it? How does India address this and how does the world, particularly America, address this? Look, we, for America, it's, it's been as frustrating as any other challenge we face because at times we've been supportive, we didn't get results, and at times we've tried sanctions, we didn't get results. So quite honestly, I think we're close to giving up. I think one question is whether China's greater involvement is automatically a source for, for bad or maybe, could it maybe? Stability, because once the Chinese have that stake, exactly. they have to make sure that. And some people think I'm naive work. for suggesting that, but I think that's possible. And that ought to be a matter for, in, for certainly for American Chinese dialogue, this question of Pakistan, because neither one of us will benefit from a Pakistan that fails or or Not with India. So would you then recommend to India also to look at the Chinese involvement in Pakistan differently? Oh, if I, well, two things. I would say if I were, in, if I were advising India, and I'm careful to, you know, <laughs> doing this, but I would say two things. One you is... You were a diplomat a long time ago. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, though I wasn't always diplomatic. The, yeah. uh, I would say that India should be... That's why we loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I think India should be generous to a fault, with Pakistan, not as a favor to Pakistan, but as a favor to itself. If India wants to realize its ambitions and play a larger role in Asia, the Pacific, and the world, in some ways it needs to be liberated from the India-Pakistan problem. And, and I realize you don't control, it takes two to tango, but I, if I were advising India, I would say be generous to a fault with Pakistan. That doesn't win elections in India. I understand, I understand the politics. The other would be obviously with China, this is, if it can be done in a way to have a dialogue about it, that might be too awkward given the dynamics of India's own relationship with China, so maybe that's better left to the United States. But I, I, I understand the political problems, but that's look, what leadership's about, is speaking to a public and saying, I know this is not going to sit well with you, but here's why I think there's an argument for India and Pakistan having a better relationship. So don't necessarily look at CPEC as a threat. A what? As a threat. 
that China is coming into Pakistan in such a big way could be a factor of stability well, or could moderate Pakistan's conduct? Depending on the details, I would be conditionally open-minded. And I right. think it's, it's up to India and the United States to try to influence China. It's one of the many reasons I'm not part of this larger intellectual consensus about assuming that China is only now a threat and that we should isolate China more. This, to me, is one of the areas where the United States and China need to have a, what, I would, what we used to call in the old days a strategic dialogue. But right now it isn't there. It isn't there, but it, it needs, to be there. needs so, to be there. So there is no strategic dialogue right now with China. There isn't one with Russia. No, sir. Uh, there Actually, isn't I, one with Europe. I was just in Russia, and I was meeting with people, including uh, Lavrov, the foreign minister. And I was stunned by how little relationship there is now between the United States and Russia. And I understand all the difficulties from Ukraine to these killings and so, and so forth. But even at the height of the Cold War, we had more of a relationship with the Soviet Union that we now that have. That you do now. And the, with China? Uh, Chinese off, not, there's not a, nearly as much of a relationship, and I think it's going to get worse because of trade. So we talk selectively on this or that issue. But I know the Chinese have been very frustrated that there hasn't been, again, a, a more fundamental strategic relationship. And it's what we need now, because this relationship's beginning to go off the rails. You know, for a long, for, for what, for 20 years, the United States and China had something in common. We opposed the Soviet Union. Then with the end of the Cold War, mm. we lost that. The danger now is we're losing a rationale for this relationship because mm. the economics have become a source of contention. Strategically now, we're increasingly disagree. So what is it the United States and China have in common? What is it we try to do together? I worry about a relationship that doesn't have a, a purpose. And that doesn't have a big vested interest. Yes, sir. So in fact, before we conclude, a point, and uh, we, can, we can reflect on it, but an observation that the only major world power or significant country that has not been publicly dissed by President Trump is India. Well, probably Japan as well. Uh, Japan, yes and no. J Japan's not got away with it that, that cleanly as India has. India has yeah. only heard good things. Uh, barring a few things of his mimicking, mimicking our Prime Minister, and I must say he's not a very good mimic. Uh, I can do better than him. <laughs> but, but does India now wait for the inevitable from him? Or does India take it and believe that Trump has figured India out in a way that suits us? Uh, I've learned one thing following Mr. Trump is I never make predictions about Mr. <laughs> Mr. Trump. He's impossible to predict. But again, I think there is a strategic logic. So even if there's some awkward moments with India, mm -hmm. the general thrust, the general trend is going to be positive. This relationship will get broader and deeper, in some ways, regardless of who's at the helm in, in either country. You know, as I said before, I really do think we're doomed uh, to, succeed. to succeed. Doomed to succeed. Uh, and the new Secretary of State, is he going to be of help? Obviously, you know him. No. Uh, We've never discussed India. Uh, we, we have discussed Afghanistan and Pakistan. We've never discussed India per se. But again, I see no reason to think that he would be outside this. There's really a yeah. consensus. But would, would you rate him vis-a-vis -vis Tillerson? Well, what he's, he's very different. He comes into the office with three big advantages. He has experience in government. Because of his time at the CIA, he has experience now with foreign policy. And most important, he's got a good relationship with this president. Mr. Tillerson lacked all three. So Mr. Pompeo begins with three big advantages. Well, I, I think there's fourth skill required. He has yes, to be a good babysitter. <laughs> I would never say that. <laughs> you would never say that. <laughs> so Richard, thank you very much. Maybe next time we reflect back on this okay. and see. Uh, uh, I suspect we are going to be right on everything. Well, don't hold me accountable for which what is, which I said. Is not, which is not very good news, but that's how it's going to be. I will fail the exam probably. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.